just to kind of walk through cervical issues in general and cervical radic, which is why we do the vast majority of these procedures. Um, just to start with a case, this is a 32 year old uh, with left upper extremity pain and uh, paresthesias, numbness, C6 distribution, and you can see on the MRI the disc herniation, and um, you can see some weakness presented with uh, just two weeks of symptoms. Um, you know, there's different options at that point, and weakness always freaks us out, but uh, it's certainly uh, two weeks doesn't have to be your only path. Um, uh, a lot of these things get better, but uh, you know, if, you're, if you're forced from a progressive neurologic deficit perspective to, to deal with it surgically, you can consider things like ACDF, which we'll talk more about in depth, posterior foraminotomies, um, historically laminectomies and infusions. And then we use epidurals to temporize and physical therapy to temporize as well. Um, but there is, uh, it, it's worth kind of diving into the, into the uh, substrate a little bit to understand what is going on and what to expect clinically, obviously take some experience in looking at the literature. Um, but on a, on a basic level, um, in terms of what transpires in the cervical spine, there's a sequence of disc degeneration, which decreases height and, and uh, diminishes load bearing capacity. This leads to abnormal forces and motions in the segment that's involved as well as the adjacent segments. Ultimately, you get reactive osteophyte formation and inflammation uh, in the uncovertebral joints, uh, which are often overlooked, uh, as well as the facet joints. You get ligament of flavum thickening uh, and redundancy as the disc height is lost. You get infolding, and, and then you can get compromise of the spinal canal as well. And then ultimately, you can develop circumferential canal narrowing as a result of this sequence of events. Um, for, the, for the fellows um, and, and uh, residents, the, there are different definitions that uh, we work with. You obviously know radiculopathy and myelopathy definitions. And when we talk about disc herniations or disc bulges, there, you know, there's different terminologies that radiologists use. It's sort of a, an art form for them. Uh, but but varies depending on the individual that's doing the reading. Um, for, for consistency, uh, protrusions are generally uh, contained disc bulges, uh, but intact annulus extrusions are, are when the material blows through the wall, the final perimeter of the uh, annulus. Uh, and then sequestrations when you actually have free disc matter out in the canal so separate from from the uh, protrusion or, or extrusion event. And then, um, and then spondylosis is just global degenerative change. And these are examples of, of those uh, different matters. You can see on the, on the bottom right here, this uh, variant of a sequestration where you have disc material all the way down here, uh, distant to and separated from the extrusion event uh, above. Uh, disc disease is pretty common in the cervical spine. Uh, greater than 60% of 40 year olds will, will have some form of it. Um, so it, it's really considered a normal aging process. Most of the time it's asymptomatic. Uh, obviously all of our patients want to know, you know what, what a traumatic event in their life led to their demise in their spine and, and uh, clearly in their neck, uh, that's the case as well. Uh, but the reality is most of it's just genetic and age related decline. There are um, uh, variants in the, the way these things present when they do have symptoms. Some people have neck pain, some people just have radiculopathy, some have uh, myelopathy, which can be quite silent with, with uh, no pain and uh, just the electrical disruption that ensues from it. Um, generally speaking, the, the cervical disc disease pathogenesis uh, becomes or, or begins in the fourth and fifth decades in life. Uh, but again, it's a genetically sort of predisposed phenomenon and you will see um, late teens and 20 year olds develop some of this just based on their uh, genetics, uh, similarly to the lumbar spine. 
it does have a greater predilection to males and it, it most commonly begins at C5-6, uh, slightly more so than C6-7. So those are the areas where you'll typically um, uh, visualize those abnormalities mm -hmm. initially. Some of the external uh, risk factors are frequent lifting, cigarette smoking, um, uh, excessive driving, and, and then obviously genetics plays a big role. The degenerative process is characterized by uh, decreased content of, of water or hydration of the disc. Uh, that right. leads to brain in the annulus and uh, fibrillation, weakening of the annulus, and you get tearing. Sometimes you'll see that as high intensity zone in the uh, perimeter of the annulus on the MRI and ultimately herniation. This is uh, really important information for you to, to uh, internalize when you're counseling people about what to expect or two weeks of symptoms. A um, couple different studies, but uh, essentially, if you look at uh, these uh, sort of old classic though? papers on uh, cervical radiculopathy, about 75% um, overall improved and 25% worsened. So really, um, if you if you see these patients in clinic, mm -hmm. uh, it's important to help guide them with that kind of that kind of uh, prognosis uh, because most of them will be pretty uh, pessimistic with the level of pain that they're in. Sleep oh, definitely comes with it. It's nice to be able to comfort them with the fact that most of the time these things do improve notwithstanding that you still have to be vigilant about their neurologic deficits and, and progression in that regard no should be towards surgical intervention. Are you frustrated? Uh, treatment no, options, frustrated. we already kind of discussed a bit uh, in general, but non surgical treatment options you see listed here. Like, Time's probably- Not even really, because like, I had three hours yesterday when I was on duty, but- Hey, can you I guys just, mute if you're- uh, I was just so, so tired, I was too tired to work out, I was too tired. Yeah. Like, Open my email. I was just hey, so Hanny, mute your phone. Is that Hanny? You know. <laughs> uh, analgesics, epidural steroids. Selective nerve root blocks are on here, but that's not really a treatment. It's more diagnostic in its uh, intention. So that, that shouldn't be in a non treatment pathway. Physical therapy. And, uh, you have to be quite cautious, in my opinion, with chiropractic treatment. Um, they have to be savvy and know exactly what they're dealing with. Uh, there are issues from a, a vascular perspective as well as spinal cord um, if they are to be um, over, overly aggressive. Uh, so that's not something I typically advocate for, although many people seek that out on their own for these situations. Um, oral steroids are quite helpful. Um, uh, it's nice to be able to give somebody that kind of uh, quick burst because it can start the day of, uh, as you know, epidural steroid injections are more potent, but sometimes harder to organize and get, get done. It can take uh, days to weeks uh, for those to occur. So we're, we're generally pretty liberal with use of things like methylprednisone to treat patients. Uh, the, this study in, um, in the spine in spinal disorders by Lynn showed that uh, epidural steroid injections provided about 63% uh, uh, avoidance of surgery. Now I'd take that with a grain of salt as we already talked about about 75% of people generally in historic natural history reviews got better on their own. So it's a little bit of self-serving, <laughs> um, self-serving information there by injectionists, in my opinion, but nonetheless, it's still a useful tool to get people from A to B timeline wise, uh, a little more gracefully and allow them to, to have some comfort on the way through. Uh, this is something that Karaji put out in, uh, in spine of 2008. And, and it's just, it, it, I don't think it's necessarily something to be too dogmatic about, but just in general know that uh, the surgical treatment and, and some injection treatment for cervical radiculopathy is reasonably appropriate. Um, but generally speaking, uh, surgery and, and other percutaneous treatments for neck pain alone without radiculopathy tends to lack scientific support. So 
doesn't mean that you don't operate for somebody with neck pain. For instance, somebody that you've diagnosed with a, a florid facet arthropathy. Um, and I think that's quite appropriate, but you have to be very clear diagnostically about what you're treating and have that affirmed. Um, and, and I think most importantly, be cautious about treating uh, spondylotic disease that is widespread with an assumption that it's generating neck pain um, based on x-rays or MRI alone. Uh, that tends to be harder to, to be confident with. I'm gonna skip through this so we can get to, uh, uh, get to our, our ACDF stuff. The outcome of non-surgical treatment is that about 70 to 80% of patients improve at three months um, as, as affirming of that early natural history data uh, and evidence that I already presented to you. So, uh, you know, very appropriate to push people through this this pathway of trying to get them uh, through a timeline of six to eight weeks or even up to three months. Surgical indications generally are uh, persistent recurrent arm pain that has not been responsive to that timeline, progressive neurologic deficits, uh, static neurologic deficits with particular pain, um, maybe even earlier, depending on the, the uh, uh, disability or impairment that in, uh, um, uh, that this leads to. And then intractable radicular pain earlier in the process if people are miserable and unable to be uh, uh, temporized through non-surgical measures and then disabling weakness. Obviously there are different surgical approaches. Um, we'll focus a little more on the inter-surgical procedures, but posterior procedures, albeit not as well uh, 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 popularized, well, uh, known and, 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 you know, in many cases, not, not done. <laughs> some people, some uh, practitioners don't, don't really uh, have the facility to do this well, uh, but it should be part of the armamentarium to manage these problems. The, um, the ACDF is a workhorse. Um, last time I checked, it comprised 80, 85% of, uh, of cervical procedures. So it's, it's really, what we rely on heavily. Um, a lot of the battle uh, for the ACDF is managing uh, the uncovertebral joint, which you see me circling right here, a critical part of the, the process of, of doing the surgery. But to get there, you got to set up. And, and so for the fellows resident, um, obviously we do these supine. The, the R positioning uh, is something you can adjust and sort of work on honing in on your own, but uh, we've sort of migrated to burrito wrapping the arms um, with a sheet. It's a nice way to keep the arms kind of tucked out of your way. Um, and um, in that context, obviously you have to be conscientious about A-lines and um, neuromonitoring leads if you're using those, uh, as well as, um, for thinking about intraoperative traction of the arms. Um, there, there are different ways to do this. Uh, we generally don't do a whole lot of, of traction on the arms, uh, certainly not statically, uh, but if it's something that you wish uh, to do just to visualize the lower cervical spine, then you can use uh, WebRel at the wrist and, and a Curlex uh, strap that you can then extend down to the end of the bed and intraoperatively somebody can grab those and sort of pull on them or, or water ski on them to depress the shoulders. That's sort of the poor man's way of doing it. There are table mounted traction or, or shoulder depression units. Those are obviously uh, more expensive. We do not have those, but they are out there. So if you're going off to a hospital that you wanna look at uh, beefing out their implements, you can look into those. Uh, probably a little more helpful for something like cervical disc arthroplasty. Uh, food for thought. Be, uh, be careful about static traction of the arms. Uh, the, the role of neuromonitoring for cervical spine surgery is actually quite suspect. Um, there's probably some role uh, for cervical myelopathy, in which case you're monitoring blood pressure and, um, and providing guidance to the uh, anesthesiologist to change blood pressure, increase blood pressure in the context of any drop in neuromonitoring is, is one potential role. I don't know that's firmly evidence-based with 
uh, elective cervical surgery at this point. However, um, if you're going to do much traction and certainly static traction, some some uh, providers out there will tape the shoulders down uh, for the duration of the surgery. Uh, in that circumstance, uh, neuromonitoring provides the role of, of ensuring that you don't develop issues from that static traction. So think about that in, in terms of how you ultimately decide to set things up. Whether you use neuromonitoring may depend on how you're going to utilize traction intraoperatively. Um, once your your arms are tucked and you've got your uh, your arms in a position you like them, um, generally speaking, I, I like to extend the neck. It, it provides uh, access between the neck. I'm sorry, between the uh, clavicle and the mandible. Um, do be cautious with patients that have neurologic symptoms uh, escalate with extension. It's uh, somewhat less common or concerning with radiculopathy, but if you have somebody with myelopathy, extension of the neck can cause a cross-sectional diminishment of the canal and you might be injuring the cord. It's, it's easiest just to determine that preoperatively. You can have patients extend their neck and if they don't escalate in their neurologic symptoms, then you're reasonably in a good stead to, to extend them uh, before decompression in the cervical spine. Uh, while you're positioning. The other, um, the other avenue is to simply utilize neuromonitoring if you're using it um, and are concerned by getting a baseline before you extend. Extending is, um, uh, can be accomplished in different ways. You can use a rolled towel or a gel uh, pack or something placed longitudinally in the upper thoracic spine that allows for the, the neck, if you will, to sort of fall off that elevated position and it, it'll increase your cervical extension. You can also extend the head of the bed um, manually. It, it, there's an ability for the anesthesiologist to drop that. And that can be done during the course of the procedure as well. So in a situation where the cervical spine might be a little kyphotic, um, extending may not be uh, feasible at the beginning, but as you do your releases and your trialing and um, maneuvering, uh, more one segment or more, you may allow for the head of the bed to extend as you work by just having the anesthesiologist drop a click or two, and then you can appreciate more segmental improvement as you uh, as you release and reconstruct. Incision strategy: um, the um, the transverse incision is, is by far the most common. It's very utilitarian for one, two level, and even three level reconstructions. Um, even three levels with a single plate are feasible through a single uh, transverse incision. It sometimes has to be a little longer to accomplish that, but feasible nonetheless. It is more cosmetic. And so um, uh, your ability to tuck it in the skin creases is is uh, generally uh, allowable. Um, and interestingly, as we've moved towards these segmental plate uh, constructs and we can localize our treatments in that way, essentially finishing each level as we go, um, we've been able to accomplish uh, four level segmental plate uh, fixations and, and potentially even move into five by strategically placing that transverse incision in a way and then working from top down and building the neck away from that, uh, from that incision. So it's kind of an interesting evolution that we may see unfold uh, um, in teaching as we go forward. The extensile incision is something to know uh, and to be aware of. It, it is generally an incision that tracks along the ster sternocleidomastoid. Uh, and we used to use it uh, routinely for three levels and more for uh, anterior reconstructions. And generally, it's a little easier to use for corpectomies greater than two levels because your, your exposure um, in general uh, has to be full at all times to do the corpectomy and more caspar pins above and below. That tends to be an easier uh, run, uh, uh, just feels more comfortable using an extensile incision for, for those longer corpectomies. And then you may consider for non-contiguous levels, um, uh, not my favorite situation, but you will run into scenarios where you have disease at um, say levels uh, C3, 4 and C6, 7 that have to be both addressed ventrally 
uh, that could be tough with a single transverse incision, doable, but you have to be thoughtful about it. And if, if it doesn't look feasible, then an extent solid incision can serve, uh, serve both masters. When you're localizing for incisions, um, I, I, I like to use the, um, and the, the uh, palpable landmarks that tends to be quite reliable. Um, it does take experience, but it, it, you know, with time and doing this a fair bit, you'll, you'll get the feel of it. Your anatomic landmarks that are most useful, and, and certainly my workhorse is the cricoid cartilage, and that generally will be consistent with a C6 level. You can fill the, uh, the, the C6 tubercle. You can also look for the thyroid cartilage, which tends to be approximately C4, 5, C3, uh, 4, and the hyoid bone. Um, and, and then the other thing to look at is the pre-op x-rays. And, and some people have really long skinny necks, and that may change things a little bit. So use all the tools, but um, uh, like I said, if you're if you're a little facile with the um, uh, underlying approach, most of the time you can get away with using these landmarks to identify the approximate location that you want to use for your incision. And then and then the next step is to look for adjacent skin creases so that you can navigate uh, through those for cosmesis purposes. When you're doing multiple levels, um, say, as I mentioned, doing a four level through a transverse incision, in general, um, I find it easier to cheat the incision a little bit caudally because the angle of approach to the spine where, where you're starting to dive towards the, the uh, deeper upper thoracic spine um, will, will favor, uh, will be more challenging uh, with a higher incision, uh, whereas it's a little easier to migrate cephalad, uh, the tissue tends to be a little more supple cephalad than it does caudad. So um, keep that in mind. An example would be if you're doing a four level, I might uh, from C3 to C7, I might cheat the incision a little closer to, to that uh, cricoid uh, cartilage versus to the hyoid, which, which would otherwise be sort of mid, midway. Um, as you, as you do your approach, uh, the, the incision obviously is made, um, and generally speaking, with the exception of obese patients, there will be a pretty clear, um, exposure to the platysma right away. Sometimes it's quite wispy. Sometimes it's fairly robust. Uh, you generally want to dissect down to that, expose it by undermining the subcutaneous tissue. And then. The, then you have a choice. The platysma can be um, dissected by transversely cutting it. And that's generally a textbook teaching. Um, I don't always do that, especially with extensile. Sometimes I will use a inline and split the fibers. Um, never totally understood why we transversely cut the muscle. <laughs> we don't do that with any other muscle. Um, and we've gotten away with it. It's probably not uh, a major issue, but uh, consider that uh, possibility when you're migrating, migrating through the platysma. Once you get through the platysma, again, you can undermine underneath the platysma just to give you a sort of a crisp visual exposure of the, the remaining layers that you have to go through. And, and part of that's to make it easier to define the pathway, which is uh, uh, first to look for the sternocleidomastoid uh, and, and I find that that's quite easy typically to see as you get through the platysma, but if you, if you lift up on your, uh, retractor a little bit, it'll help to find the pathway medial to the SCM and you start exploiting that with your med scissors or whatever dissecting tool that you want to use, including your finger. If, if they have softer, more supple connective tissue, you can often use your finger to dissect straight down, uh, from then on but scissors are typically needed to, to uh, separate the fascial um, tissues and spread through them between the medial structures of the trachea and esophagus and the sternocleidomastoid. Um, it's a good idea when you, when you start doing this to palpate for your carotid sheath uh, by palpating the carotid, uh, and that should be lateralized to your ultimate uh, trajectory. So you wanna, you wanna uh, 
start dissecting medial to that sh sheath um, in a longitudinal fashion between that structure and the esophagus. Once you're down um, uh, between those structures, you'll have the retropharyngeal fascia, uh, and those uh, those areas are best to, to simply dissect through with your scissors and or your uh, 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 peanuts and uh, spread off the, the fascia from the uh, nearest disc or the disc that you're targeting. And uh, then it's, uh, as I said on this slide, localize that level of the snap, not a needle. Um, I think I've even written a book chapter about using a needle. <laughs> so ignore that. You, you, should, you should use a snap so that you don't violate the disc and create a degenerative cascade by sticking a needle in it. You know, that practice is still out there, but be cautious with it in that regard. As you're doing that, um, even at the step that you snapped it, um, you can compress some time and get your, your tech uh, ready by uh, measuring the length of your blades uh, for the retractor. Those can be getting ready while you're localizing with your imaging. And then as, uh, uh, as you uh, confirm the level that you wanna operate on, you can begin elevating the longest coli from the midline, uh, moving in either direction above and below the disc, creating a cuff uh, with the longest coli and tendon to allow for your retractors that go medial lateral to, to uh, hook under that cuff. And, and part of the rationale of doing that is it gives it a good foothold uh, to keep it centered over the disc space. But the other practical uh, implication of doing that is you're helping protect the sympathetic chain, which runs along the, the lateral aspect of the longest coli. So it, if you do uh, fall out of the longest coli, which is not uncommon as you're working, you want to be conscientious about replacing your your medial lateral retractors under the sympathetic, I'm sorry, under the uh, longest coli during the course of the procedure. And then place your, your uh, cast bar pins. Um, so as far as um, uh, the procedure, it's pretty standard in terms of um, uh, moving back through the disc space. So uh, be cautious with young, healthy discs if you're uh, a little bit overly aggressive with your knife cutting into the disc. Remember, it can be fairly shallow and you can, you can cut back through the PLL and actually cut the dura or, or worse. Uh, you don't need to dive that deeply. With a real spondylotic spine, it won't be much of an issue. Uh, after you remove the disc, uh, then you want to resect the uncovertebral joints, at least in part. Uh, that, that can be an area of persistent stenosis. Um, getting uh, resolution of uh, foraminal compromise is um, still a matter of some debate. How, uh, there are um, proponents of simply fusing the spine and, and belief that the stability alone will ultimately lead to happiness for the nerves or even some dissolution of the uncovertebral joints. Uh, Howard on at, uh, at Chicago kind of popularized that concept. But um, others um, like Dan Rue fully resect the joint um, because of some, um, you know, and I, and I will add to that experience of persistent foraminal compromise and, and uh, um, radiculopathy as a result of, of persistent foraminal um, uh, uh, stenosis from the uncovertebral joints being robust. And perhaps that can be some growth as, as there's uh, healing of the fusion and um, some robustness of that process uh, because of inadequate stability early on in the process. But regardless, um, undercutting, really being thorough with your decompression out into the frame and is advocated. Uh, you can use different tools, uh, autograph versus allograph. Uh, we're obviously the, the standards for a long time. Um, the autograph uh, was all we had for quite some time, uh, but came with it. Uh, what came with it was some graft site morbidity. Um, uh, I think many people moved from tricortical and structural graft to using um, using more uh, more sliced bone for, through a, a burr hole or a, 
a small hole in the uh, cortex of the iliac crest. And that's tended to be much less morbid if you look at the, the studies that have highlighted that. Uh, nonetheless, it does take time. Uh, there are uh, uncertainties as to whether it adds great benefit as we move to different tools. Uh, with a fibular allograft, probably is beneficial to use an autograph. Uh, not so sure with some of the newer tools, new, newer uh, cages that we're using. Uh, and, um, and then the other issue to be uh, keeping in mind that I think we have been sort of short stripped uh, over the over the years in the cervical spine, and we're starting to pay more attention to is just alignment, being able to reproduce uh, segmental lordosis, uh, optimize that in the cervical spine has has been a bit of uh, an unknown or at least an afterthought in the cervical spine, but may have similar implications as segmental realignment has had in the lumbar spine, and so. I've tended to favor uh, those implants that allow me to modular, uh, in, a, in a modular way, be sensitive to that issue. When you're decompressing, obviously be wide, uh, be sensitive to the, the width of the implant, uh, maximizing it is, is a bit more ideal to prevent subsidence, uh, be sensitive to the depth and then idealize the, the lordosis. And then very importantly with plate position uh, being uh, less than uh, about four millimeters tends to increase your heterotopic uh, adjacent segment uh, change. And so trying to stay away from that by uh, being quite close to the disc level that you're working on and angling the screws if needed, particularly in short statured individuals is, uh, is ideal. So that's it with court with ACDF. I'm not going to keep going on on the rest of the cervical stuff because we're out of time, but any questions?